So uh, we're in this message series called Pearls. And what we've been doing is looking at the book of Proverbs. And uh, Proverbs, there's 31 chapters, and the author is attributed to be Solomon, um, the son of King David. Solomon's an interesting cat. <laughs> he's an interesting guy. And God gave him wisdom, and, and he's known to, there's nobody else to be like him. You know, nobody had wisdom before or after him. Um, and and you, th- you read these, bo- these Proverbs throughout this 31 chapters, and, and you catch some wisdom that he throws down. Every once in a while, when I talk to people and I share something like fragile, I share something that has truth, I share something that's vulnerable, uh, that, that they could, you know, they can pick it up or they can hurt me. I always tell them, I just threw some pearls at your feet. I just want you to know that. Um, but that's what this series reminds me of. And, and today, we're looking at a famous chapter, uh, chapter seven. But before we get into this, I want to start off with a question. Have you ever gone down the wrong street? Ever gone down the wrong street? You know what I'm talking about? Let's just talk about it at a surface level. Maybe you're in your car. Maybe you were in a different city. Maybe you were in Detroit or Chicago, or you were in some place that was sketchy, and you were like, oh, maybe you were in Colfax, <laughs> or there was, and you're going down, and you're like, okay, I don't think I should be going down this street. You know what I mean? And you're looking around and you're like, I don't recognize this stuff. Quick, roll up your windows. <laughs> Lock the doors. You know what I mean? You're, you're like, my spidey senses go up and I'm, like, I'm going down the wrong street. How about this? Have you ever gone the wrong, down the wrong street spiritually? You ever done that? Have you ever, maybe, maybe, uh, maybe it was uh, in front of your, in front of your laptop or Maybe you had your phone in your hand, and you were just looking at some things, and something popped up, and it was just one click, two clicks, three clicks. Or maybe it was a movie. You were, in a, you were checking out a movie or something, and you were checking out Netflix or something, and you were like... Oh, this is, I probably shouldn't be, uh, this should be over soon. This scene should be over soon. And it's, yeah, it's, yeah, it's got bad. Yeah, it's, it's all right. It'll, it'll pass. Ooh, it hasn't passed yet. You know, <laughs> have you been there before? Or maybe it was a game and you were in this game and, and you were having a conversation with another gamer and you started talking to like dude underscore four, three, two, four. And it was just a conversation. And all of a sudden it, it went to a place that you thought, well, I, I, I don't know if I should be sharing this with a stranger. Or maybe it was with a conversation with a neighbor or a friend or someone at work. It was one joke, and it led to another joke, and it led to another joke. And then it was led to an invite. You know what I'm talking about? Maybe it was at school, the fun conversation, whatever it was. And you just find yourself, you're like, okay, well, we started here. I started here, and I didn't really mean to get over here. But now I, 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 I just took one step, and I just took another step, and I just took one more step. And now I'm in a situation of like, this doesn't feel good. What do I do? I'm pretty far down the street. Now, now what do I do about this? And, and then you're left with this moral decision of, Boy, I feel like I'm compromising right now, but we've just, it was just one, two, three, four clicks away. And well, nobody, I'm not hurting anyone, and I think it's okay, and nobody sees me, and I think it's all good. And, and at, at the end, the end, you're wondering, like, how did I, how did I get here? You know what I'm talking about? Can anybody relate to what I'm saying? Can you, can you like just put your hands together or something if you can relate to what I'm saying? You know what I'm talking about? <clears throat> I want to talk to the real people today. I don't want to talk to the people who act like they have it all together or who spend their time managing their image to convince other people they have it all together. I want to talk to the person who knows they don't have it all together. And that's me. You guys with me? And I want to talk to the person who's always thinking this sermon would be good for someone else. I want to talk to you. We all need God's grace. Turn to the person next to you and just tell them, God's not done with you yet. Can you do that? Just so that we all recognize we're, we're, we haven't arrived. We all, we all need it. I've been guilty of going down the wrong street. I remember taking a job, and I remember having mixed feelings. This was in Colorado Springs when I was going into the Bible college. And I, I just, I liked the hours. I liked the pay. And, and just like anyone else, I was attracted to the money, to the flexibility. And I went into it. And the whole time, I had feelings of, Reuben, don't do it. And I ignored it. And I went into it anyway. And every single day, it's like God was talking to me and saying, are you going to go in today? 
Are you going to do it again? Are you going to do it again? And I remember being in it for months, thinking, what am I doing here? And I was never happy. I've been there before. Well, I have good news for you. Here's the good news. God's grace is greater than your wrong turn. God's grace is greater than you being. Aren't you glad you have a God who will travel with you on the wrong street? That's the unfailing love of God. He will go down that wrong street with you all the way to that bedroom or that car or that bar or that club or that strip joint or wherever you're at or that workplace. He will go with you even if you go to, I mean, going down the wrong street. He's like, you shouldn't be here. You should have never left, but you went anyway, and I'm still with you. That's the grace of God. I'm overwhelmed and I'm grateful that we have a God full of grace. You really appreciate God's grace when you're the one who needs it, right? That's how it is. Today's title is Lust Boulevard. Hello. Isn't this cool with our, our team guys that they built this just for today's message? Isn't that cool? And I, they asked me, what, what street sign? I said, let's, let's make streets. So one of them has to be Lust Boulevard. But they asked me, what do you want the second one to be? And I said, well, let's just do 120th. Let's just make it 120th. Can you catch them and turn it so you can see 120th? Because guys on camera can't see that. So it's, it's 120th. And I said, um, I want you to have 120th because it's familiar. You know what I'm saying? It's like 120th is not bad. And it's so common. We're, we're on 120th a lot around here. And, and, and it's just something we know. The church is off 120th. So this is like, there's nothing threatening about 120th. Are you following me? But we know there is another street we can go down that'll lead a different place. That'll lead a different place. Oh, man, you're going to love Proverbs chapter 7. I'm just telling you. What's lust? New Testament word for lust. I'm, I'm excited to share this Greek word with you because I don't get to do this very often. Epithumeo. Epithumeo, which means... Desire, desire, desire. It's been defined as intense or unrestrained sexual craving or an overwhelming desire or craving to set your heart upon, to long for, to covet. And let me say this, all of us have been, been down the wrong street. Here at Thorn Creek, Thorn Creek is a place for people who went down the wrong street. We all need the grace of God. We all do. You ready to jump into this? Chapter 7. Here it goes. So Solomon says this, my son, and then what are those three words? Keep my words. Now he says son. So Solomon is writing to his son. Okay? So this is David's grandson. And he's writing to his son. And he says, and store up my commands within you. So Solomon's not talking about like some kind of surface relationship with God. Solomon is giving his son advice on how to walk with God, on how to do it when, you're, when you face temptation, on how to do it when you feel attacked, how to do it when you have a low day. And, and he's saying you got you to have the, the commandments of God, the word of God, you got to store it inside of you. Within you, say within you, say within you, within you. That's what he's saying. Have it inside of you, within you. So this is something that the word of God is living and breathing. That's why it's so important to spend time in God's word every single day. You got to do it every day. Verse two, keep my commands and you will, what? You will. And here it is. Guard my teachings as the apple of your eye. We're going to go back to that. Bind them on your fingers. Write them on the tablet of your heart. Say to wisdom, you're my sister. And to insight, you're my relative. They will keep you from the adulterous woman, from the wayward woman with her seductive words. So before Solomon goes into this story about this naive young man, first five verses, you know what he's doing? Let me just tell you, how to walk with God. Let me just tell you how to stay on the right street. I'm just, I want you to understand how, how you can make sure you don't take the wrong turn. This is it. So for the first five verses, um, Solomon is telling him here, you got to make sure God's word is within you. So your heart, 
You got to make sure you have this relationship with God. You got to make sure that, that your, your walk with him is authentic. You got to make sure that you're, you're walking in this faithfulness and obedience. You got to make sure. And then he says, guard my teaching as the apple of your eye. What does that mean? I wanted to put a picture of a pupil in front of you. Because when you look at the original language and what this apple of your eye means, the eyes, incidentally, they're incredibly sensitive, aren't they? What happens when there's some dust in the air or something you know, flies towards your face? You instinctively close your eye, turn your head, you know, kind of thing. Instinctively, your eyes are incredibly sensitive. But they also have been known as the windows to your souls. This phrase, the apple of your eye, in Hebrew culture, the pupil is known as the apple of your eye. The pupil. In fact, in this studies, the word apple means the little man of the eye. That's the original Hebrew root meaning. It's in other words, if, if you're looking at someone's eye and you get close enough and you look into their pupil, you know what you will see? A reflection of yourself. I mean, that's, that's what it, this was literally the apple of your eye means. The pupil. The reflection within your pupil. Whatever it is. So, so that's what the apple of your eye, it's the center of your eye. So here's what I want you to hear. Your reflection determines your direction. What, what's reflecting from your eye? What are you looking at? It might be yourself. You might be looking at the mirror. You might be taking selfies a lot. What are you looking at? It might be a job. It might be money. It might be a guy. <laughs> it might be a girl. What are you looking at? It might be some videos. It might be whatever it is. What are you looking at? Your kids? Are they the apple of your eye? Well, Solomon is saying the only thing that needs to be the apple of your eye is the word of God. That's what he's saying. Whatever else you're chasing in life, whatever else it is, the only thing that needs to be the apple of your eye needs to be God's word. Because you got to understand this. What you stare at, what you look at intently, what you look at <coughs> longing, will eventually become your desire. Whatever you look at for a long time, it will eventually become your desire. It's like that guy who's looking at that girl that he's interested in. He just can't get his eyes off of her. He looks at her up and down. You know what I'm talking about? And then she turns and looks at him, and he wants her to know, I like you. <laughs> you know, I can't get my eyes off of you. Now, if you creep her out, stop looking at her. That's not what is. But the woman knows. You like me. Why? Why does she know that? Because you're staring at her. You're looking at her. What are you looking at? I think we can look at things that affect our heart. Have you ever looked at hurt? You can't get past hurt. You can't get past something. And that's the reflection of your eye. All right, let's go ahead and jump into this, guys. Verse 6, here's the story. While I was standing at the window of my house, looking through a curtain, I saw some naive young men. And one, say one with me, and one in particular who lacked what? Common sense. Literally, that phrase, who lacked common sense, means void of understanding. This is a person who doesn't think about where this street goes. This is a person who doesn't think twice about it. This is a person who doesn't think about the spiritual ramifications of jumping on this street. This is a person who overestimates themselves and underestimates what this street has for them. You know what I'm talking about? This is a person who just lives for the moment. They don't think about how this decision is going to affect the future at all. They don't realize what's at stake. Have you been there before? I've seen it happen lots of times, and I bet you have too. 
you know, there was something that happened to you and, and it just kind of sat and eventually it affected you. And maybe it affected you so much that you walked away from God or you walked away from a church or you walked away from a marriage or you walked away from family or you walked away. You know what I'm talking about? That kind of thing. I think about that, that teenage, that high school student, that young woman who, who's just, you know, made some decisions and doesn't think about the consequences or that young man who makes some decisions or that older man who's flirting at the office and doesn't think much about it or looking at stuff and looking at porn at night or whatever and think it won't affect me. Or that woman who is stubborn and everybody knows it and she doesn't think her stubbornness is going to affect her. And she still calls herself a Christian. Men, women, we're all there. Verse 8 says this. He was crossing the street near the house of an immoral woman, strolling down the path by her house. He was crossing the street. So check it out. He was going down the wrong street. It was the wrong house. And it was the wrong woman. Wisdom starts with proximity. Wisdom starts with proximity. It's like, you know what? I'm just going to stay away from that street. I'm not going to go down it. Uh, one of the lies of the devil is, you'll be all right. You're in control. You got it. It's not affecting any. You can stop it whenever you want. You can get off it whenever you want. You're in control. Doesn't that feel good? Who doesn't like to have that kind of sensation? But wisdom starts with, you know what? If you don't want to go down the wrong street, then don't get on it. There's wisdom right there. And then the other part the Lord showed me this is um, he was strolling down the path. This phrase literally means to walk in a leisurely way. Do you ever look at how people walk? I look at how people walk. Everybody kind of has a walk to them, you know, the way they walk. You know, some people walk with attitude and they're just swinging or something like that. And some people are like speed walkers all the time, Stephanie. Uh, whatever it is, you know, we all have our own walk. And some people, like, when Grace and I go on walks, I walk slower. And she's a faster walker. And I'm like enjoying the flowers and I'm enjoying, I'm just taking my time. And I'm just, and this scripture says that he was strolling down. He was just strolling down. You know what that tells me? He wasn't expecting a fight. He wasn't expecting a battle. His defenses were down. He wasn't expecting something to happen to him that potentially could put his life in a different trajectory. He wasn't expecting to go through something in one moment that would affect him for the next 10 years. You know what I'm talking about? He was strolling down Reminds me of this high school young woman who strolled at the mall. Decided to go walking around the mall and met this guy. They talked at the mall, flirted with each other. One thing led to another. They shared contact information and developed this relationship. And the relationship, they started seeing each other outside the mall. And, and then all of a sudden, things went to another level and... And he knew, she knew he was not a, the right guy, and she didn't care, you know, and she did it anyway, and she ended up having sex with him, and ends up getting pregnant, and it eventually affects her family, it affects her home, it affects her mother, her father, the whole thing just kind of is like a grenade growing up, you know, exploding. But it started off when she was just on a walk. Just on a walk. Didn't think about the consequences or where it would lead. Hear this, you're most vulnerable when you're just chilling, <laughs> you're most vulnerable. When you're not expecting a fight, when you're not expecting anything to happen, you're just hanging, you're just looking, you're just scrolling. You're most vulnerable. He's not expecting the devil to attack him. And then it says this, it was at twilight in the evening and deep Darkness fell. Deep darkness fell. So he goes down the wrong street. He goes down the wrong house. And he walks past the wrong woman. Now he goes at the wrong 
time. Who, who are you at night? I mean, don't we change a little bit at night? I do. I, I mean, today kind of threw me off with the solar eclipse thing happening. <laughs> like, but we're a little bit different at night. We're like, I don't know, I'm just kind of in a different mood. And I always, you know, we all know that at night you do things that maybe you wouldn't do at 12 o'clock in the afternoon. You know, it's time to have fun. It's time to party or whatever it is. It's getting dark. So you got to hear this. Your circumstances are just as important as your intentions. You got to be aware of your surroundings. You got to be aware of the company you're in, the, 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 the people you're running with. You got to be aware of how you're feeling right now. If you're feeling discouraged, if you're feeling hurt, if you're feeling like you're in a funk, if, you're, if your headspace is not in the right place, be aware of who you are, where you're at, the mood you're in, the feelings you got. Be aware of the circumstances because if it's the right circumstances and you're going down the wrong street in the wrong time and the wrong house and the wrong woman, when it's all set up, you could do things that you never thought you'd do. You can fall. Scripture says, he who thinks he stands, take heed lest he fall. First Peter says this, be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. And those first few words says, be alert and of sober mind. Be alert and of sober mind. Be alert and of sober mind. That means you're aware that you've got a target on your back. And the enemy would love nothing more than to separate you from the God who loves you. The enemy would love nothing more than for you to make a bed with anger and resentment and bitterness. The enemy would love to sleep in one of your rooms in your house. And he'd want you to buy the mattress and make sure he's nice and comfortable. The enemy would love to live in your head and speak lies to you. Here she comes, the she-devil. Here she is. <clears throat> Verse 10. The woman approached him, seductively dressed and sly of heart. She was the brash, rebellious type, never content to stay at home. She is often in the streets and markets, soliciting at every corner. I so wanted to play some really sexy music during these verses, guys, but I thought it would be distracting if we did that, so I didn't do it, so you can just imagine. You know, Marvin Gaye or something like that, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> You know, that's, anyway, where am I at? Verse 12, but I read the verse 12 already. Soliciting at every corner. You know what she looks like, right? You know, <laughs> ladies, if you don't want to send a message, just don't put a sign that says, you know, anyway, I'll get in trouble. I better stop right there. I've said stuff before from here that I shouldn't say. Don't put a sign up that says, like, business is open. You know what I'm talking about? You can dress like that in a certain way. My son's waving his hands, telling me, stop. Verse <laughs> 13. She threw her arms around him and kissed him. And with a brazen look, she said, oh, my goodness. You know what I'm talking about? She threw his arms around him and just, I mean, laid it on him. You know what I'm talking about? Just laid it on him. I've just made my peace offerings and fulfilled my vows. You're the one I was looking for. Oh, bada bing, bada bum. I came out to find you, and here you are. My bed is spread with beautiful blankets with colored sheets of Egyptian linen. I've perfumed my bed with myrrh, aloes, and cinnamon, and musk. Yeah. 
<laughs> I gotta get going. Okay, come, let's drink our fill of love until morning. Wow, this is an all-nighter. <laughs> Sounds good, doesn't it? <laughs> I gotta keep going. Lord, help me. Let's enjoy each other's caresses. For my husband is not home. He's away on a what? Long trip. Mm, mm, mm. He has taken a wallet full of money with him and won't return until later this month. So, she seduced him with her pretty speech and enticed him with her flattery. Wow. I feel like I need to take a break after reading that passage right there. I need, to, I need to cool off a little bit. It's a pretty heated passage, isn't it? And she loved the word of God. She said, I came out and here you are. You, you know what I think when that I read that part? Um, sometimes I think, I think, I think that we convince ourselves that it just, if it just happened to, you know, be in front of you, then it's really not your fault. I mean, you just walked into it and there it was, there she was. I mean, it just happened. It's not my fault. I didn't go looking for it. I didn't go looking for it. It just happened to pop up. It just happened to... I, I wasn't looking for it. So because of that, it's a coincidence, which makes it okay, which means I'm really not that responsible here. It's the circumstances, the coincidence of life. It's like a free pass. Because it happened in front of me, God understands. God understands. It's not my fault. I'm a victim here, to be honest with you. I can make a case. I'm a victim here. If I wasn't so darn good looking. <laughs> if I, you know what? I had no idea why this thing. If I, you know what? I, it's not my fault. It's not my fault. Yeah, I probably shouldn't have gotten in the car with him. Yeah, I probably shouldn't have gone out with him. Yeah, I should have. But yeah, but then it happened. Here it is. Just because it pops up doesn't mean it's okay to click. Hello. Just because it pops up. You have this God who wants you to live a holy life. He's a holy God. And he wants you to live a holy life. You know what he's passionate about? You being holy. That's what he's passionate about. And it pleases him when you strive to live that kind of life. The other thing that popped up to me was this. Um, she seduced him with her pretty speech and enticed him with her flattery. What's flattery? In 1828, Noah Webster's Dictionary, I'm <laughs> going back here, had a great definition for flattery. Here's what it said. To please a person by applause or favorable notice by respectful attention, or by anything that exalts him in his own estimation, or confirms his good opinion about himself. That's what flattery is. Flattery always feels good, doesn't it? When someone says flattering words to you, here's some good advice for you. This is how you should take flattery. Someone said, flattery is like chewing gum. Enjoy it briefly, but don't swallow it. There it is. Isn't that good advice? It's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm good looking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Whatever. <laughs> yeah, I'm really talented. Yeah, I'm really, yeah. Enjoy it for a little bit. But don't you swallow it. What happens if you swallow flattery? You exalt yourself a little bit, don't you? You start thinking highly of yourself. You know, we didn't read uh, First John. Um, but, but in First John, it talks about lust and and, and it, it marks these three different types of sins that attack our relationship with God. You know what it is? It's the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. 
lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. All of us have faced one of those or all of them. Yours, yours truly, <laughs> all of us have. Uh, ch- check this out. I want to say this. Attractive men and hot women may look good on the eyes, but it's a slippery slope that leads to a fractured soul and a divided mind. It is a slippery slope. And that's what it does. It leads to a fractured soul and a divided mind. When you find yourself at this place and you're down the street far enough and you're here, you know how you feel inside? Man, I'm a hypocrite. I thought I was better. I thought I was stronger. Oh, can God even forgive me? I don't even like myself. I don't know. I should just stop. I'm done. I can't stop. I want to stop. I can't stop. I want to have strength. I don't have the strength. You know what I'm talking about? Anybody been there before? You know what I'm talking about? And you're at that place and you're like, gosh, I know what my heart wants, but I just can't do it. And then look at this woman. She starts playing mind games. She says, my bed is spread with beautiful blankets and colored sheets of Egyptian linen. And then she goes on talking and talking about, I mean, and look at the way he's, he hasn't even entered the house. And you know what he's imagining? The beautiful blankets, mm, the colorful sheets. Oh, remember they were Egyptian linen. You know how that feels? I don't know, but it sure sounds good. That is like Egyptian linen sheets. I just like, I'm feeling it right now, just all over my body. And the smell of perfume from the street. He's like, Oh, I've smelled the myrrh and the aloes and the cinnamon and oh my goodness, I'm just there. All those senses. Hear this. The trips you take in your head are just as important as the trips you take with your feet. That is so good, guys. The trips you take in your head. You know what I'm talking about? When you're driving, when you're walking, when you're away, have you ever been talking to someone and then they stare off and they're like gone for a while and then they come back and you're like, welcome back. You know, <laughs> the trips you take in your head are just as important as the trips you take with your feet. You know why? Because it does this thing. It goes through the apple of the eye and it happens in the imagination and you start imagining some things. You start fantasizing. That's why porn is so big. That's why porn makes more money than uh, all the major league sports. That's why it's, it's huge, a billion, billion, billion dollar industry, because it's all about your imagination. It's all about your imagination. <clears throat> the circumstances, her husband's away on a trip. He has a bag of money. He's gone. He won't be back for a long time. He has enough. He won't be caught. Now, let's just, I I think we're quick to throw rocks at this, guys, but let's just be honest. If you were him, right? And maybe you've been hurt or discouraged. Maybe, Maybe you feel like you've been whatever. If you were him, if I was him, can we just be honest? You know how to avoid it? Don't get on the street. Don't get on the street. James says, each one is tempted when he is carried away and enticed by his own lust. I I find this phrase interesting. Uh, The the Lord showed me this a while back. But he is carried away and enticed by whose lust? His own lust. It's already there within him. This is not something that he bought off the shelf. This is something that lives within him. He just imagined it. Then, say then, when, the, when, his, when lust has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And when sin is accomplished, it brings forth death. There's the ultimate road here. So in James, you see this progression, temptation being carried away, your own lust, Lust becomes sin, and then eventually it leads to death. Verse 22 says this. Here's how this naive, incidentally, naive young man means a simple-minded man. That's what it means. 
here's how he responds. He followed her at once, like an ox going to the slaughter. Wow. I just, I mean, <clears throat> he was like a stag caught in a trap, awaiting the arrow that would pierce its heart. He was like a bird flying into a snare, little knowing it would cost him his life. You see how the whole narrative changes? I mean, what happened to all the perfume and the aloes and the cinnamon and the Egyptian sheets? And, and what happened to all of that? All of a sudden, it shifts to he's a cow about to get slaughtered right now. You see that? Here's the reality of it. Here's the other side of that fantasy. Here's the other side of that sin. Here's the other side of that. All of a sudden, all of a sudden, it's no longer an innocent road. It's no longer flattering words. It's no longer perfume and spices. And the reality is, he's like an ox getting ready to be slaughtered. Anybody grow up on a farm? Anybody seen a you know, cow or something killed? It's pretty graphic, isn't it? And there's the ending of this picture is, this guy has been blindsided. Have you ever been blindsided? Didn't expect it. I just went down the road. But it was a wrong road. <laughs> it was the wrong house. It was the wrong woman. It was the wrong time of day. And I was in the wrong place. And I went there anyway. You know, she smelled so good. She said flattering words about me. I've always thought pretty highly of myself. It was nice to hear someone <laughs> affirm how great I am. She said all the right things. I've always thought highly of myself. Verse 24. So listen to me, my sons. Solomon's going back. And pay attention to my words. Don't let your hearts stray away toward her. Don't wander down her wayward path. For she's been the ruin of how many? Many men have been her victims. Uh, haven't you, I and mean, we're just talking about, she's talking about men, so let's just talk about men here for a second. I can't tell you how many men I've seen fall like this. I can't tell you how many pastors I've seen go down the wrong road and think I'm in control. It breaks my heart because I know the devil and the devil just wants to bring down people. It never, never makes me happy. I'm grateful we have a God of grace. Her house is the road to the grave. Her bedroom is the den of death. Wow. Whew, I got to take some, just breathe a little bit after all that. I just have to breathe a little bit. Where are you at right now? Some of you might feel like you're on the wrong street right now, and I'm so glad you came to church. There it is. The devil doesn't have a hold on you. You're here at church right now, and you're seeking God, and you're saying, God, I need you. Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. You have a God of grace. Yeah, praise the Lord for that. I'm thankful for the God of grace, guys. I'm thankful for a God of unfailing love and mercy. I'm grateful for that. There's some things that, that I, I saw in this. The Lord showed me something else. Um, this, uh, this book was written by Solomon. Somewhere between 10, 15 and 975 BC, somewhere around there, 1015 and 975 BC. That's when it, when it was written. So he writes these words. He eventually dies in 931 BC, and that's when the kingdom is divided. Now you have the northern kingdom, kingdom and the southern kingdom. But towards his old days, I was telling Andy this, we went out this week, I was telling Andy, towards his old days, you know what, what happened when he was old? He fell in love with foreign women. That was his Achilles heel. He was a good looking guy. I mean, Bathsheba, she had to be a really good looking mom. I mean, David fell for her. And David is a good looking guy. So, I mean, he's got two good looking parents. So I'm guessing Solomon was good looking. I'm guessing he was. But scripture, God specifically told him, don't you run after foreign women 
because you're going to worship their foreign gods. If you chase after those foreign women who worship pagan gods, you're going to eventually bow to those pagan gods. You know what I'm talking about? And I just look at, it's so ironic to me that Solomon is telling his son, this is the danger of going down the wrong street. And when you look at Solomon's life at the very end, he's building shrines for pagan gods. He's building altars for pagan gods. And his heart turned away from the Lord. And I thought about, what could we learn from that? And you know what I thought? Knowledge is not enough. I think there's something inside of us that has to say, you know what, I don't want anything to come between me and my God. I don't want anything to come between me and my God. And I know I screwed up and I know I shouldn't have, but I don't want anything to come between me and my God. I don't want anything to stop me from growing closer to God. I don't want anything to keep me away from God. I'm going to keep going and I'm not going to give up. I'm going to keep walking and I don't want anything to come between my God because I love my God and I love him so much and I don't care about anything else. I don't want anything thing to come between me and my God. I think that's all it is. I think that's all it is. It's that thing inside of you that says, no way. Yeah, it was one night, it was one moment, but I'm not going to be defined by one moment. I'm not going to be, I'm not going to let the devil have a hold on me. I want to say this, God works in your weakness. It's in your weakness that you discover you're not that strong, right? It's in your weakness that there's this other thing happens. You become resolute, right? It's in your weakness that you make a decision on, okay, I don't want that, right? It's in your weakness that you make this internal choice this decision and you become determined you become determined and you're like okay i that happened and you know what else happens in your weakness you discover it really is about him and this really is true and i really do need his grace and you become resolute you become determined and you become strong maybe you've blown it all of us have maybe you're here at church or maybe you're watching online and you've blown it Maybe you feel like you failed. Here's what I want to say. First John chapter 1, verse 9 says this. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. God sent his son, Jesus Christ, into this crazy world 2,000 years ago, approximately, so that he could become a sacrifice for your sins. And because of the blood of Christ, we can experience the forgiveness of God. We can experience the cleansing power that comes from his Holy Spirit. Because of Jesus, our sins are forgiven when we accept him as our Lord and Savior. And we can live a new life because of Jesus. And everything changes because of that cross. The wrath of God was on that cross. We don't always talk about that side. But the wrath of the God, he carried the weight of the sins of the world. And it doesn't matter what you've done. It was on his shoulders at that cross. All you have to do is receive it and accept it as Lord and Savior and say, all right, Jesus, I want you to be my Savior. And with your mouth, you confess. With your heart, you believe. Psalm 37, I love. Hang with me, guys. It says, the Lord directs the steps of the, of the what? Of the what? The godly. He delights in every detail of their lives. And check it out. Though they stumble, they will never fall, for the Lord holds them by the hand. When we're talking about the godly, though they stumble. Another version says like this, when he falls, he will not be hurled headlong. I just love that. Because the Lord is the one who holds his hand. When the righteous person falls, and I love the picture, God's holding their hand. And you know what they do? They get up again. And they say, I'm going to learn from that one. 
I'm going to learn from those circumstances. I'm going to learn from that experience. <laughs> when a righteous person falls, they say, not today, Satan, right? <laughs> they say, I'm going to keep going. I'm going to keep going. Here's what I want to do. Here's what I want to do. I want to give you an opportunity to make a U-turn. I want to give you an opportunity to get off that street. And maybe you're here at church right now and you're on the wrong street, whatever that wrong street looks like. And maybe you have um, anger inside of you or hatred or resentment and you're really good at carrying grudges. Or maybe you have lust inside of you. Or maybe you have something else inside of you and maybe you just feel like you're living two different lives and God knows it. And you don't, you know what I'm talking about? If that's you, you don't have to walk out the way you came in. God wants you to turn to him with all of your heart. The Bible calls it repent. He wants you to turn from your sins with a devotion and a commitment to walk with God. But you have to have that broken heart, that broken heart, that contrite heart, that heart that says, God, create in me, create in me, God, create in me a clean heart and renew a steadfast spirit within me do that you have to you have to you have to want it you know what i'm talking about you have to want it you have to want god more than what you're experiencing over here you have to want god more than what this is giving you you have to want god's will for your life more than this temporary pleasure you have to want god more you hear that so i want to invite you to turn to god and repent for some of you, it might mean to put Jesus first in your life and to accept him as your Lord and Savior. For others of you, you might call yourself a Christian, but you're like that righteous person. And you're like, yeah, I need to repent. Wherever you're at. So here's what I want to do. I'm going to say a prayer for you. And what I want to say is we're going to do a couple things. I want the, we're going to sing a song after this prayer. And, and the song is part of your prayer. So I know some of you, when the pastor starts praying, you slip out of the building. You know who you are. You leave church quicker. Oh, he's praying now. Nobody's looking. Let's go ahead and leave church. Don't do that. This is all part of it, okay? So do not check out. Do not peace out yet. Don't do it yet. I want to lead you in a prayer, and then we're going to sing this song and make this song part of your prayer. But let's pray first. If you're ready to make that U-turn, here it is. Say, Jesus, I turn to you. I need you. I'm on the wrong street. And maybe you need to say this. Jesus, I want to become a Christian right now. I ask you to forgive me for my sins. I want to give you my life. I want you to be my Lord and Savior and my God. I turn to you with all of my heart, mind, soul, and strength. Get behind the steering wheel of my life. I want all of you. Others of you, God forgive me. I'm down the wrong street and I don't have the strength and I hate myself and I'm discouraged and I need to get right with you. So right now, I ask you to deliver me in the name of Jesus Christ. I confess my sin before you. I repent and I ask you to just put me in your arms. Rescue me. In the name of Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. Now sing this song like it's your prayer. I've come a long way. I've seen how you were. There's so much goodness and grace. Tell them. Much more than I deserve. Tell them. Because I know who I am. Make it your prayer now. And I can stay where I'm at. Yes, Lord. We've come this far by faith. That's right. And I just can't turn back. Yes, Jesus. He's not done with me. Say, Jesus, I need you. He's not done with me. Jesus, I'm coming home. 
Put your hands together. Praise the Lord. So I'm, I'm going to share with you the secret sauce. This perhaps is the most important part of the sermon. We're about to close it out with a great song called More Like Jesus. And the lyrics in this next song tells you how to stay off the wrong street. Galatians chapter 5 says, Those who belong to Christ Jesus have nailed... You know what, guys, let's read it out loud together. Those who belong to Christ Jesus, come on, have nailed the passions and desires of their sinful nature to his cross and crucified them there. Nailed the passions and desires. Verse 25 says, since we are living by the who? Let us follow the who? Spirits leading in how much? Every part of our lives there it is so here's what i want you to need here you need the holy spirit to stay on the right street you need the holy spirit to stay on the this is not about willpower you need a greater strength than your own strength and this is the secret sauce right here you need the holy spirit and when you experience that holy spirit your passions and desires are crucified with Christ Jesus. So now I want to say another prayer for you. And it's for you to receive the Holy Spirit. Say this, God, give me your Holy Spirit. Make me strong. Give me a new power. Give me a new strength. Speak to me, God. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.